the next talk, which is uh, behind the scenes. So um, I know that for a lot of you, it's a bit mysterious of how these games are actually run. There is a lot of documentation, but we thought we actually take the opportunity and give you a bit of an introduction of how all our infrastructure code that we've written. So not the auto referee, not WeBots. I know you all know how that works. Um, but the, all the infrastructure that basically we, that we set up to run all of this in the cloud, we thought to give you a bit of a small overview. And uh, yeah, so Andre starts with a bit of an introduction to the infrastructure, and then I'll show you how the Amazon Mechanical Turk interface works. And we'll actually start one simulation um, to show you how we usually run the games. Um, and with this, Andre, I hand over to you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, nice. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. We do. Okay, nice. Okay, um, yeah, so we use VBOTS for our virtual competition, and this is how VBOTS looks like. And normally, you would just write your you know, robot code on the right. And as you can see, there are these uh, VBOTS includes. So there's like a VBOTS API that you would typically use. So this is the very, very standard VBOTS setup. You have your client code, and it just directly uses the VBOTS API to connect to VBOTS. Um, the problem with this is that um, the robot client now um, can manipulate everything like in the whole world, and it can read all the ground truth values. So that's not what we want uh, for our competition. So what we developed is uh, what we call the player controller, which is basically an API server. Um, so it restricts kind of the access of the VBOTS API. Um, so you can only do things that are allowed or that should be allowed to do. Um, and in theory, we can now already scale this uh, setup. So we can have um, yeah, one robot client and one player controller um, per robot. So we have, yeah, and all of these can now connect to VBOTS. Um, but and this, in theory, also works. Now, now all the robots can play uh, a game. But the problem is that now the rules of the games are not enforced because all the robots can just do anything, and and um, yeah, nothing will uh, yeah, they, nothing will really happen. So what we developed is what we call the auto ref, the auto referee, and the auto referee. Um, yeah, for example, takes out robots if they break the rule, and uh, yeah, rule, and it also automates the game controller. Yeah, so um, it switches the uh, game states and so on. Um, and typically, um, the setup would be that all the robot clients have their have a team com or do some team communication via UDP, and um, they also. Um, connect to the game controller, or connect is the wrong word, but they um, send packet, uh, packages to the game controller via UDP and receive packages directly from the game controller via UDP. Um, but this, however, because we run this in the cloud, this doesn't work because turns out the cloud doesn't support UDP broadcast. So instead, what we developed is what we call the UDP bouncer. And um, yeah, basically the idea is, for example, if you want to do a team communication, then a robot client uh, yeah, sends a UDP packet, package to the UDP bouncer, and it then mirrors this package to all the other uh, clients from the same team. This also has the nice effect that, um, for example, team A can't uh, intercept the packages from team B. Um, yes. And um, yeah, and the and another thing is, so for example, the auto ref um, automates the game controller. So it switches a state in the game controller. Then the game controller sends a UDP package to the UDP bouncer. And the UDP bouncer then sends stuff to the robot clients. So this is how the, um, how the network flow would be. <coughs> um, so if we deploy this, um, we so if all of the teams have four robots, then in total we would have nine VMs. Um, so one virtual machine where everything uh, VBOTS related is contained in, 
So that means uh, VBOTS itself, the game controller, the auto ref, the UDP bouncer, and all the player controllers. And um, the robot clients, or every robot client has its own VM. Um, yeah, from the team's perspective, um, before each game, what they do is they push a Docker image, they upload a team JSON to S3, and they upload a robot model to S3. And the team JSON basically contains the robot model, and or for, for every robot, it contains the robot model and um, some poses. And the robot model is, um, yeah, describes, <laughs> describes the robot and it's written in the uh, proto file format. I'm not sure if it's specific to VBOTS, um, but yeah, maybe it is. And um, yeah, so the deployment process basically has three main steps. So first we do the setup step, then the run step, and then the upload step. And um, as I said, we use Docker. So in the setup phase, um, on each VM, we pull the Docker image specified in the uh, team JSON from the Docker registry. And we also copy over the robot models um, from S3 onto the uh, VM where Rebots is running. <clears throat> Then there's the run step. And in the run step, we run all the Docker images um, and we execute rewards. And so after the uh, simulation is finished, we then have the upload step where we take all the Docker logs on all the uh, robot VMs and upload them to S3. And we also take the VBOTS log and upload that also to S3. And then from S3, we distribute them further to the teams. Um, yeah, so some facts. Um, so the infrastructure, so all of the infrastructure code um, yeah, consists of 1,500 lines of Python and 1,000 lines of Bash. Um, yeah, and I also want to, wanted to mention thank you to Ludovic for helping us a lot um, for setting up the infrastructure or coding uh, stuff for the infrastructure. Um, then we have the auto ref, which uh, yeah, is about 3,500 lines of Python. Um, and I wanted to mention, yeah, thank you Ludovic for implementing that. Uh, Olivier for implementing that, sorry. Um, yeah, so on each game day, um, it took us roughly one to three hours um, to deploy the games, to upload um, the stuff, to distribute the logs, and um, if we run into bugs, to solve the bugs. Um, yeah, we usually deployed that with three people, so <clears throat> me, Michael, and Jasper. And sometimes games need to be restarted and um, yeah, the track record for that was uh, three out of 33 games needed to be restarted. Um, yeah, and in this season, we had one series bug in the auto ref that we needed to fix because if we didn't fix that, then the game or the simulation wouldn't have, uh, I'm not sure, finished or it, I'm not sure what exactly the problem was, but that was a series bug that without fixing it, the simulation wouldn't have uh, yeah, worked. Um, and there are a lot of uh, some kind of like headache problems, like the NVIDIA driver, which breaks regularly. And so I've spent hours on fixing the NVIDIA driver alone. And um, yeah, so yeah. And I think with that, it's everything I wanted to mention before we start our live uh, demonstration. Yeah, and just one thing to uh, mention is that almost, or I think two out of those three games actually had to be restarted because of that bug. Um, and yeah, that bug uh, caused the auto referee to crash. So uh, the game the game wouldn't finish. So let me share my, can I not share my entire screen? Why does it not allow me to share my entire screen? Must have sharing? No, you're not. Um, 
Okay, then I will switch between uh, sharing options. So I'll go with this first. I hope you can see um, my browser window now. Uh, so this is AWS. For those of you who haven't seen it, this is what we used. We actually investigated in the beginning between uh, AWS and Microsoft Azure, but Azure didn't have the machines that we actually need. So what you see here is our um, VM instances, our virtual machines. We always have one small virtual machine that runs the um, all the stuff basically that is um, um, or that that we use to run things. Um, basically, that monitors our entire game state. It doesn't need to run a lot of things on uh, on its own, but it basically allows us to all be connected to the same uh, little server um, and run the games from there. And then we always have one simulation instance. And you see here, this is a quite large instance that we are using. So the G4DNs are the machines that have um, GPUs available. And we use a larger one for the simulation and then smaller versions for the teams. And we want to want to get demo game here. So I reduced the amount of robots to one per team. And you see that those machines are not running at the moment. So let's start them. Um, so that we can use them in a bit. So this is basically one of the things we are using. That's the virtual machine setup. There's a lot of stuff behind there as well that makes sure the network connection is right, that the right ports are open and stuff like this. I won't go into detail on that part. And um, I wanna show you some of the other things that you basically see from a different perspective. The first one is the ECR or the container registry. So that's where you upload your Docker images to. And what you notice here is that we have two versions. So let's look into BitBots code, for example. And um, this is basically where BitBots would push their images to. So this is the interface or the link um, that we have handed out to the team. So that's where they push the, the image to. And they can do this anytime. Now we always had this Docker pull time communicated. And what happens during a Docker pull time is that we have an automatic script that pulls these images and then distributes that to a clone version. So that URL is not known to anyone except of us. So we basically make sure that um, no one else can push apart from us. And this is always pushed and pulled automatically at the correct timing. So that means when you message us and say, hey, sorry, we uh, uploaded ours 10 minutes too late, we can't really do anything about it because it has already been automatically distributed um, here to um, our clone versions. So we make sure that we don't take any scripts that were, or any Docker images that were actually sent to us um, after the time that they were allowed to. So this, this clone version is basically what we are pulling from um, when we pull things to our robot machines. And then we also have our S3 storage. So that's basically Amazon's storage. And what you see here is again, um, let's take the uh, Berlin this time. So what you are um, used to from your perspective is that you have your um, your, your team folder here and then the robot model and team JSON folder. Um, at the moment it's empty here. But again, we are not pulling from this directly. What we are, or at least not the robot model. The team, the team JSON is actually pulled from your folder directly. However, the robot models need to be investigated by the TC first to make sure it's according to the rules. So they are not taken from the team folder directly, but they're manually inspected. And then we are moving them over to the robot models folder. So when we look at the robot models folder in here, we have again, the inspected um, robot model and the automatically pulled team JSON and that gets pulled at the same time as the Docker images are pulled over. So that's basically how the infrastructure looks from our end. And um, now let me quickly stop. So you see all our machines are running now. So let me stop sharing and let me share. If you have any questions in the meantime, you are welcome to ask them at any time. Uh, let me switch over to this guy here. So um, now you see hopefully my terminal um, and that's um, now our small machine that I talked about. And that's what we use now for running things on. 
Um, so you see, we have a bunch of scripts in here. We have scripts for um, the, the automatic pulling of the Docker images. We have scripts for uploading um, log files in the end to our three storage. But I, what I wanna go through with you today um, is mostly related to the game manager, like the heart of actually running this. And yeah, again, huge shout, shout out to Ludovic because he was the one who was mainly developing this. So what we first need to do um, is we first need to actually know um, or set up our field. Our field means we have to um, tell our um, game controller what the IP addresses of all the, um, the machines connected are. So we basically have to run a small Python script that Jasper developed um, that fetches the field IPs and we run this and that's already done. So now what this did is um, if we go into fields um, then we have field A, for example, that was the one that we are playing on. And yet now that basically pulled both the public and private IP addresses from this um, uh, from the fields. So let's go back. And um, the other thing we have to do is we have to distribute SSH keys. That is mostly that we are able to actually pull from our um, Git repository. Um, Mike, perhaps you want to increase a bit to the dimension oh. of the terminal. I, how do I do that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, with uh, try with the font. Increase try with the, the font. font size. Does control plus work? Does control plus work? No, that doesn't do anything. Control mm. mouse wheel maybe. Oh, change settings. Let's see if we can change settings. Uh, appearance. There it is on the change button. Ah, okay. Hopefully now it's better visible. It is. Um, okay, cool. So uh, yeah, so now we distributed the uh, SSH keys. So that's done. That's basically the main setup step, step we have to do. Let's uh, look into one more thing before we actually start the game and that's the schedules. Um, so in here we have both the competition schedule and we have the training schedule. Today we are running a training game. So let's look into the uh, training schedule. And um, I already added the one that we want to run today. So basically when we go all, that's all the test games we ran by the way. So uh, I added one here that zero first RFC Berlin versus BitBots. It's a short game type. Um, that basically just um, sets some settings for us, how long the game is going to run, and it's a kid size game. And we also uh, clarify here that it is on uh, going to be played on field A. So that's all set up already. So um, now we are basically ready to run the game. So let's actually look into um, the game manager. So that is a huge bash script and um, I'm not going to go through all of it, but what it basically does is it runs through or it gives us a bunch of options. And um, as Andre said, we start with a setup step, then we have the run step. We are able to abort games, we're able to upload things and then also clean instances It basically automates a lot of things that we otherwise would need to do manually. Um, and we have a bunch of parameters. One that is very important is, for example, the texture seed. So um, we basically um, add a new texture seed. Uh, Jasper literally threw uh, dice to um, get a new texture seed for every game that we would game day that we would run, and that's what we would add here. And a lot of the stuff that we have here um, is in the end just run to. Um, or it's just part that that's get added to different JSON files um, or configuration files. So how would this now look when we actually run a game? So the first thing we have to do um, is we can ask the game manager um, Excellent, that was what I expected. Uh, so let me quickly stop sharing and uh, set the access keys because that is something we cannot share. Otherwise, all of you guys would have uh, access to that. So let me quickly do that. Um, in the meantime, if there are any questions, you are very welcome to ask them. 
Um, Mike, you can also share multiple screen by holding, I think, control shift. So. Yeah, at the moment, I don't want to share screens. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, we are back. Uh, we have set our AWS key. Um, so now, um, now we can actually run it. And you see here that what it uses is it asks us if we are doing training or competition. That's basically mostly looking at the schedule, um, which schedule we are looking at. Then we have to give us the game tag that was um, this number that's a unique identifier for a game. And then the action is what we actually want to perform. So usually we would um, start with a check to actually see how our machines look at the moment. So as I said, we are running a training game and the game tag is T142. Um, and the action is check. Is it a test? Is it just T? Yeah, it's just T. Um, and what you see here is that um, we basically have both our machines set up. And that's what I did yesterday already, because uh, the BitBots image is quite large and it takes around uh, 10 to 15 minutes to pull. Um, I've already done the setup step yesterday, so you don't have to go through this together. But what you basically see here is um, the instance status of all the, the client instances and also of the um, simulator instance. And we see here, okay, the last thing we did is we pulled our Docker images and they are done. How we would do this if we would actually now run all of this live is that instead of check, I would do config here. And then once I have done config, that basically just configures the machines with some basic scripts. And then the setup step, that was what Andre was talking about, that actually uh, pushes the Docker images and that also pushes the robot models. As I said, I'm not going to do this now because we've already done that. Um, and I don't want to waste time uh, waiting for Docker images to be pushed. So what we would do, do now is we would actually do run. Um, and when we do run is that it basically says, okay, I don't find an XORG server. A lot of this stuff is things that we ran into a lot of times did manually and then added into scripts. One of it is this one. Um, so what it does now, it says, okay, I have um, two robot IDs, basically, I have a red one and a blue one, and now I am running these Docker images, and it also starts all the things related to the, um, um, the simulator. So if you have a look at our check again, that's basically our best friend, and um, that's what we use mostly to actually see what's going on um, on the machines. We run now, we see now for our uh, client machines that a Docker has started. Uh, so we see that the last thing here has happened that a Docker started. And if we, was it control shift B? No, control. Ah, oh, damn it. What was scrolling up again? Can someone? Uh, control B and then window up. Aha, uh -huh. thanks. <laughs> um, I haven't done this in two weeks, so I always have to look this up again. Uh, so let's see what happens here now. Uh, so this is our, um, this is basically some um, issues still. Our simulator instance is telling us nothing to worry about. But what we see here is basically that the run started. And then um, we see that the referee now says XORC is on, the game controller is still off, and WeBots is on. So that means that we, checked it quite early. The game controller wasn't started yet. So if we do um, um, check again, now we see here that our game controller is on as well. And if we go up again, we see the last things that um, happened basically on our uh, simulator machine. So we see that um, now the game state is, in this, uh, is set to ready, uh, kickoff is blue. So we see a lot of things here. So you can basically um, look at most of the most important messages from the auto referee as well while the game is running. And that's basically how we make sure while the game is running that everything looks according to plan. And you see also here the remaining game time that tells us um, how much time 
seconds left in the game in terms of real seconds. And then also the average speed factor, which is really high. And because we only have two robots, usually uh, we would see around 0, 0.0 um, something for uh, the games that we are running. So quite a low speed factor. Uh, the quicker games took about four to five hours to simulate. Uh, the longer ones, mostly BitBots games, took around 12 hours to simulate. Uh, so yeah, that's basically how this looks. And if it's done, which you would then see that the um, that in the end the game control or the WeBots ended gracefully, then the last step we would do is we would do an upload, and that basically takes um, all the log files from the simulator machine, from the client machine, um, and then puts them back on our S3 storage. And then we have different scripts that once our um, streaming is done, distributes them back to the computer or to the, to the FTP servers or S3 uh, storage systems of the teams. And then we have two more things here, which I'm gonna use now. Uh, one of them is a board. So if we, for some reason, don't wanna continue the game, we can send them a board. And then this is going to stop um, the game as it is. It stops the Docker. And then we can clean the instances. And that's what we always do in the end. That basically removes all the Docker images, everything related uh, to the teams. Um, yeah, and basically make sure that we can reuse the machines for the next game. And we are planning on releasing all of this infrastructural code. And the problem is that at the moment, it's a bit of a um, late night grown code, very unwell documented. Um, and we also need to make sure that there is nothing in there um, that's actually like secret keys or something and um, that we can't uh, distribute. But we are hopefully uh, releasing this uh, soon for everyone uh, to run this as well. And then you can run your own uh, simulated games just as we do um, in uh, on AWS. <laughs> 